is going to the voting booth and making a selection. Well, hello and welcome to The Voice. In our continuing effort to bring you some candidates that are running for office this fall, tonight we're going to have a special edition for the state Supreme Court. And tonight we're going to start with Justice Paul Newby, who is the current sitting lone conservative on the state Supreme Court. And so welcome to The Voice, Paul. Well, I'm delighted to be with you, Tammy. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, it's our high honor to have you with us. And um, I just wanted to start out by asking you a little bit about your background. I know you're a lawyer. You wouldn't be running for the court if you weren't. So tell me a little bit about how you got here. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, an interesting story. I mean, my mom was a school teacher. My dad, an uh, hourly worker, I had no idea I would uh, even go to law school. We, we didn't even know any lawyers growing up. Met my first lawyer on my way to becoming an Eagle Scout. And I had the opportunity to work for Warren Berger uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court during wow. the summer of 1976. It was the bicentennial of our decoration. And I so uh, love those words that our rights come from God. You know, just so, uh, such a, a great truth, a foundational principle. Me too. Yeah. So, so that, uh, you know, encouraged me to go to law school. But interestingly, I didn't like Washington. So I decided to stay in North Carolina. I jokingly say I've spent my whole life in North Carolina, but the four year, except the four years I went to Duke. And then I went to UNC <laughs> to Law School, where I met my wonderful wife, Macon. Uh -huh. And uh, 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 we, uh, you know, I practiced law in Asheville doing transactional work, uh, almost 20 years with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then as I was praying about our state, our nation in 2004, uh, just really burdened with activist judges who were imposing their will, uh, uh, disregarding the legislature, disregarding the uh, political process of trying to determine uh, policy in the public square. Uh, you know, I was thinking, well, who died and made him king? This just doesn't seem right. So, <laughs> that was a foreshadowing, wasn't well, it? I mean, it's yeah. even worse now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. So in 2004, it was nonpartisan. I uh, sense the Lord putting on my heart, well, what about you? Are you willing to run? Here I am, Lord, send somebody else. This sounds crazy. I mean, Scooby Dooby vote for newbie, really? Is that where <laughs> we're going to go? But anyway, uh, as my wife and I prayed about it, we ran one in four, one again in 2012. So I've been on the court 16 years, senior associate justice, and uh, it is a challenging time. I will admit that. Wow. Well, you certainly have the experience, and I would say the judicial temperament to make a great justice. So thank you for that 16 year service. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that you let our audience know about your uh, prosecutorial experience as yeah. well in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Yeah. Um, now you just sort of brushed over it though, but you are an Eagle Scout, right? That's right, <laughs> yep, yes, an Eagle Scout. And uh, and you won some award like for the highest Eagle Scout award? Well, there, there's an, a national recognition for Eagle Scouts who kind of exemplify public service and that kind of thing and somehow they, they, they chose me and then I got a heroism award for rescuing nine people out of a riptide. So, wow. you know, I'm, I'm very humbled by all that stuff. I mean, well, know. and you're humble about it. So that's why I wanted to highlight it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so Paul, y you mentioned it, but, um, I want to go back and talk about your judicial philosophy. What mm -hmm. is your philosophy when you sit on the bench? You know, uh, and, and it's foundational, uh, and yet it seems to be lost on so many. I mean, our, fa our, our framers recognized that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So they divided the powers, we call it separation of powers, where you have the legislative is supposed to make the law, the executive is supposed to carry it out, and the judicial is simply to decide the cases that come before it and protect our fundamental rights and freedoms you would think it would be rather straightforward. My judicial philosophy is that I uphold the Constitution as written. I call that being a constitutionalist. Uh, I'm a conservative. That means I don't swerve over into the legislative lane and legislate from the bench. I simply decide the cases that come before us based on the law. We call that the rule of law. And uh, it's equality before the law. Lady Justice is blindfolded. She can't see who comes before, rich, poor, powerful, not powerful. Everybody is treated the same. The law needs to be consistently and fairly, impartially applied in every case. We call that the rule of law. It's foundational to who we are as a uh, representative republic. That's wonderful. And um, so now you're sitting on this court where you're the lone conservative on the court. 
Is that the norm? I mean, do the other members of the court have the same kind of judicial philosophy you have? Uh, sadly, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I recently wrote an opinion and, and, uh, where I said, uh, as a monarch, King Louis XVI famously said, it's the law because I'm king. Sadly, today, four members, because we're a seven-member court, four members of this court adopt this approach to the law. I mean, it was a 4-3 decision, so uh, uh, even two others said, uh, majority, you are going way further than what the law would allow. You know, I call that legislating from the bench in my dissenting opinion. So mm -hmm. uh, I certainly am concerned uh, for the protection I'm fixing to pull out my constitutions. Uh, you know, what's a judge without a constitution, right? <laughs> Federal and state. Mm -hmm. We are the highest, uh, we are the last word on what this document means. Uh, several years ago, our court, along party line votes, uh, changed the word law to not mean what the General Assembly had passed alone, but to mean also governor's policy preferences. That's, wow. that's a huge difference. It is. Uh, and it had to do with should we have a nonpartisan Board of Elections, or should we have a partisan Board of Elections that will continue policy preferences in an election process that one would think would be the fairest of government actions? And we're seeing the results of that decision today. I was just getting ready to say that. Just in the last week or so, we've seen the results of that. So I, I love it that you carry your constitutions <laughs> around in your pocket. That's yes. great. Yes. That's the kind of judge I want. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually don't use these as just kind of uh, guidelines, they are the constitutions. They precisely what they say is the way they should be applied. I so appreciate that about you. So tell me, uh, of the sitting justices on the Supreme Court now, um, whose philosophy most mirrors your judicial philosophy? Uh, I would say Justice Thomas. He mm -hmm. has been a faithful originalist, a faithful uh, textualist with regard to the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, and has just been bold. And I, I so admire his bravery. I mean, he has stood up to whomever would come against him. Mm -hmm. His life story is so compelling, and he gets it. He understands that either we apply the Constitution as intended or we're making it up. Exactly. I, I admire him, too. And, of course, he's a man of faith like you yes. are. Yes. And uh, so I, I identify with Justice Thomas as well. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question. Last year, the uh, Supreme Court in Kansas, which is similarly situated to our court with uh, six liberal activist justices and one conservative, somehow found in their state constitution a constitutional right to abortion, which um, was just shocking that uh, the state Supreme Court would find that. And they found it in the Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Happiness Clause of their constitution. Um, so we we um, we have that same kind of court, and I just wanted to ask you, you know, is our court, do they have the same kind of judicial temperament that the Kansas Supreme Court, and uh, uh, do you think they'll be activists, or do you think they'll be uh, originalists on this? On this? Well, uh, who can predict the future? You're correct. Article 1, Section 1 of our current state constitution says that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all are created equal and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and we're entitled to the fruits of our own labor, which are certainly at issue mm -hmm. in so many of the orders that come before the court. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't predict per se, uh, but I will say that uh, I seem to have the only originalist philosophy uh, so the language in our Constitution is certainly similar to the language in the Kansas Constitution. Uh, will uh, a six to one court or maybe a zero seven court, would they go that direction? Uh, I don't know. I hope not. I do too. I pray not. And um, I think our audience can see why it's so important that we elect uh, Justice Newby to be the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court because of his judicial philosophy and temperament. And I just want to let our listeners know that we have endorsed Justice Newby in his bid for re-election. And I hope you'll remember that as you go to vote. Um, so, Paul, where can people go if they want to sign up to help you? PaulNewby.com. Okay. And, uh, you know, in this election process, it's interesting. So the first two times I ran, had to uh, know just name. And so uh, the question this time becomes, 
uh, well, how do we know who these judges are? And thank you and your organization for helping get the word out to educate voters, to make it all the way down through the ballot. And uh, as they go to do that, uh, they don't have to remember Scooby Dooby vote for newbie this time. <laughs> uh, they just need to think, okay, do we want conservative judges? If so, does Republican mean conservative? I think it does. Then if they vote for the Republican judges, but th everybody needs to know, look at the ballot carefully because, uh, for example, I'll be second on the ballot. Uh, uh, Two other, uh, Berger and Berenger are both first, and all the Court of Appeals judges are second. So you start thinking, there's no pattern here, and that's right, there's no pattern. You've got to read the names to be sure you're voting, your vote, uh, that you fill in the little dot or however, uh, you're, you're voting, that it's for the person you, you really want to be there. That's a great reminder. I appreciate that. So tell our listeners before we end tonight's session, um, exactly why it's so important that you win this seat. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, which of your constitutional rights do you value the most? Uh, and at the end of the day, when that right is threatened, who's going to be there to protect that fundamental right? Mm -hmm. We have given that responsibility to judges. And do you want judges who will fairly, impartially, consistently uh, apply the law as intended, apply the Constitution as written, or do you want folks who are substituting their own judgment for what the actual language said. I want, I personally want, and my philosophy is, you stand by the written language of the constitutions, and that language is there to protect our fundamental God-given rights. That's why judges are so important. Great, thank you. I couldn't think of a better way to end. <laughs> and I, I hope our audience can see how qualified Justice Newby is to hold the seat he's held for 16 years. And I hope you'll help reelect him again for a third term on the state Supreme Court. Paul, thank you for coming and being with us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, I'm honored, Tammy. And thank you for uh, providing this opportunity for your listeners, your viewers, to know more about the judges. And now we're going to take a short break. Welcome back, and I just want to say that we have a great privilege tonight because we have a candidate for the state Supreme Court with us, uh, Tamara Berenger, former state senator. And yes. uh, Tamara and I have known each other for several years, and I'm so excited for you to get to know Tamara a little bit better tonight. So welcome, Tamara. Thank you, Tammy. This is such a privilege. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and to also get to, for you to get to know me better uh, out there as you're listening tonight. Great. Well, let me just ask you about your background, Tamara. I know you're a lawyer or you couldn't run for the state Supreme Court, so tell me more. Oh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, I uh, have 35 years of legal experience. This year uh, marks my 35th year as an attorney. Wow. I have over 20 years of practical business and tax experience. Um, I served in the General Assembly for over six years, and in that position, uh, I drafted 32 bills that are now law, wow. and uh, they ranged from, uh, of course, I hope we'll talk about my passion, foster care and children in crisis, but bills uh, that uh, related to children and families, but also uh, uh, the business and tax bills that uh, are now law, uh, 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 bills and laws for the disabled, for those who cannot speak for themselves. Um, as a matter of fact, Tammy, I will share with you that uh, back in 2013, I was the only elected tax attorney in the General Assembly, and so I drafted much of the 2013 tax reform, and so I can say to you, I lowered your taxes. That's great. Well, that is good to know, Tamara, because I doubt that many of our listeners tonight would know that. Also, I have spent uh, over 15 years uh, in the Master of Accounting program in Chapel Hill as a professor, uh, and before that uh, at Keenan Flagler, and before that I taught for five years at NC State University. I also developed the first business paralegal program for Meredith College, and so uh, I guess you could say that I have practiced law in a very practical way, representing businesses and families with their business and tax problems. I have have 
uh, written and drafted laws, made laws as a legislator, and I've had the wonderful privilege to teach law uh, now for over 20 years. The reason that I'm running and the reason that I stepped into public life really has to do with the public service that my husband and I have done. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, um, God laid it on our hearts that we might consider being foster parents. Uh, and the reason for that is that Brent and I, my husband of 38 years, uh, Brent and I began thinking about how was it that we were so, so fortunate, uh, how that we had so much, and we truly believe that those who are given much, much is expected. And we had one common denominator, and it was a great family. Because you see, Tammy, um, when I was growing up, um, I came from a very modest background. My first home did not have indoor plumbing. When I wasn't even two years old, we lost our entire tobacco crop in an uninsured barn fire had to move off the farm into a single wide trailer. And my mother and father dug us out of that poverty. And it was so wonderful because I never realized that we were poor. But you Isn't know what? That great. <laughs> we weren't poor. Yeah. We weren't poor. I had this wonderful family, a mother and a father who loved us and took care of us. We also live in the nation where opportunity is there. And my father was able to get a good job. He went to work in, in a mill. Uh, working swing shift, but he was able to rebuild our economic uh, independence. And I now can say that I'm first generation college. Uh, my sisters and I all graduated from college for the first time in our family. And so my husband and I were looking at how did I go from, from that really uh, modest beginning to being an attorney and carry and, and a professor in Chapel Hill, we uh, decided we'd be foster parents and we did that for 10 years. Wow, that's quite a story. Um, I, I don't think I knew that about you until today. So um, thank you for sharing that. And um, what a great way to share the great family you came from than to bring foster children into your home. So tell me what you worked on in the General Assembly, just briefly. I am so proud of what we did for children and families in the General Assembly. Um, when I first went to the General Assembly, we were turning foster children out on their 18th birthday, just turning them out no matter where they were, college, not college, uh, struggling through high school. And those children would go and live under bridges or couch surf with a friend. Mm -hmm. And frankly, statistically speaking, within two years, they were incarcerated or had other outcomes How that, sad. That, that were not good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but now, foster, uh, fostering success is law and these, these, these foster youth can stay in, in college or community college or workforce development. Uh, also, um, for example, uh, foster parents could not sign a permission slip for a child. And so think about it, you've got a, a child with no family, marginalized, um, having to go sit in the principal's office when these children, the rest of the class, got to go to the General Assembly or to, um, to the fire department down the street. That's how, so, how unfair. so unfair. So yes. unfair. But now, because of the Foster Care Family Act, which also allows these children to learn to drive and do other things that ever, all the other kids get to do, uh, they have a more normal life. That's great. It sounds like you have a heart of compassion. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want to thank you for the work you did in the General Assembly especially the work, I mean, people still talk about you at the General Assembly oh. for the work that you did on foster care and adoption. So thank you for that. So Tamara, can you share with me, why did you decide to run for the state Supreme Court? Well, Tammy, my uh, life verse is Jeremiah 29 11, And I truly believe that God has a plan. It is so important that those children and families have a voice on the Supreme Court that understand not only the law, but also that they're human beings and their, their situation. We're rebuilding our economy and rebuilding our, our, our very society after the COVID, and we need to have judges that understand that part of the law. Also, I will bring extensive practical business and tax experience. And again, we'll be rebuilding our economy. We, we really don't have judges that understand tax and business on most of our courts. Right. And that voice is needed. And finally, I'm just very concerned that the current court is not following the law the way the people, speaking through their senators and representatives, have built that law, have made that law. 
Wow, that's great. And I'm so glad to hear your concern in all three areas. Now, explain to our listeners what your judicial philosophy will be when you're elected to the court. My judicial philosophy is conservative, constitutionalist, and common sense. I call it the three C's. What conservative means for a judge is that I'm going to follow the law as it was written. Words have meaning words have plain meaning. They were written by people who represent the people, the representatives, the senators and representatives. Constitutionalist, I'm a strict constitutionalist. Great. I believe the Constitution uh, was written with specific words that have specific meaning, and those words are important. And finally, I'm not going to leave my common sense at the door. Great, that's wonderful. So the court right now is packed with activist judges. We have one conservative and six activist judges on the court. So why is it so important for you to win this seat? It's critical, Tammy, absolutely critical. Even if you did not uh, agree with the judicial philosophy, the court is completely imbalanced. We need voices from both sides. But frankly, we need people, we need judges who will follow the Constitution and will follow the laws as they were written. And that's why it's so critical. Right now, those activist judges are, are uh, releasing pedophiles, notwithstanding that the law says that they should, should be in jail. They're recreating so many of our, uh, our business laws to make it far more difficult to conduct business mm. in the state. Wow. Uh, we don't need that kind of, of, of ju judiciary. We need judges that will follow the law. Let's put it, it's, it's this simple. We don't need seven judges overriding the will of the people that has ev either been spoken to by the referendum of the people with, with, their, uh, with their vote or through their representatives and senators that they have duly elected who very thoughtfully brought those laws into action. Well, Tamara, we certainly hope you're elected to this seat so that you can do that. And uh, to our audience, I think you can see why the North Carolina Values Coalition has endorsed Tamara Berenger for her Supreme Court race. And uh, we wish you every success in the race. And thank you for being with us tonight, Tamara. Well, thank you. This has been a wonderful opportunity. And I do appreciate and do need your support and your vote and your prayers. Thank you. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. I love my freedom, freedom to express myself, freedom in knowing I am safe, freedom of loving my God and telling the world. I love to read my Bible, I love going to church, and like many of us, I love doing a lot of good things. But I can't anymore, things are changing. When I walk into a bathroom, I have to be scared because it's no longer a place of safety and privacy. When I go to my school, I'm supposed to hide who God has made me to be. Even when I walk into my church, something is different. The love, the joy, the peace, where has it gone? We shouldn't have to live in fear of being punished by the government because we live according to our religious beliefs. The places I enjoyed being, things I enjoyed doing, a country I was proud to be in. They're all changing now. But what if my future didn't have to be like this? Imagine if I could live a future of freedom. Freedom to serve a God I love and believe what I believe and not have to hide it. What if I told you the power is in your hands? If I could do something, I'd do anything. And all you have to do is vote. Your decision now will impact my life everywhere and in places we can't afford to make mistakes. So what will you do? Will you vote for me? Welcome back. Well, now we have another one of the three Supreme Court candidates tonight who is actually a friend of mine and has been for several years. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Phil Berger. 
Well, Tammy, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with you and, and to speak with you. I uh, appreciate the work uh, that, that you do and, and our friendship. So thank well, you for having me. Thanks for saying that, Phil. Now, you and I met uh, about eight years ago um, when I was the chairperson for the marriage amendment campaign. And um, we had some people on the other side making some rather audacious claims about what the marriage amendment would do. And um, tell me what position you were in at that point in time. And, what you did. Right. So, so I was the district attorney uh, in an area near Greensboro uh, at the time, and uh, Tammy had approached me about some information that had been spread through some advertisements and uh, uh, discussions with people who were opposed to the marriage amendment. Uh, and, and that centered around some domestic violence issues, whether or not um, individuals, uh, or if the amendment passed, uh, if uh, domestic violence laws would, would be impacted. And uh, I emphatically said uh, no, and Tammy was kind enough to, to ask me to uh, take a position on that. And uh, through the course of that debate, through the course of that campaign, I uh, got to meet some very uh, wonderful people and got to know Tammy very well. Uh, and, and, you know, history sort of bore out our position. That, Ex that exactly. It was a ridiculous claim and you were willing to stand up and tell the truth about it. So thank you. Right. Well, no, thank you for allowing <laughs> me the opportunity. Yeah. So tell me some more, Phil, about your background. Right. Well, so, so I was born in rural North Carolina, uh, grew, grew up rather in rural North Carolina, um, went to high school, public high school, was involved in athletics, uh, went off to, to UNC Wilmington, uh, met my wife there. My wife, Jody, and I have been married for 24 years and uh, we've got two great kids. Uh, Philip is a um, sophomore in college, and my son Will is a junior in high school. He's a little different with high school and college now. We're, we're glad to have mm -hmm. the one uh, in college, and uh, we've got another one cooped up uh, upstairs because he's, he's all virtual right now. But, um, you know, family's a big part of, of who I am and uh, who we are. Uh, but, but Jody and I met and then went off to law school, graduated from Wake Forest and then went into the family business. Uh, worked as an attorney in Rockingham County for about eight years and then ran for district attorney. Was elected uh, DA two terms and had the opportunity to serve as president of the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys, where I worked with DAs across the state to improve the administration of justice. Uh, and then in 2015 became an administrative law judge. And, and your viewers are going, what on earth is an administrative <laughs> law judge? Uh, so, so really handling uh, appeals involving state agencies. Mm -hmm. So if, if, when you get your mm -hmm. um, uh, property tax statement, there's a fine print on there that says, you know, if you don't like this, you can appeal. Uh, at some point, those appeals make their way up to an administrative law judge. So we handled um, cases involving sheriffs and, and law enforcement training and standards, um, DEQ issues. Uh, so, so lots of different administrative law type issues. And then in 2016, was elected to the Court of Appeals, where I am now. So uh, that, that's just a little bit about me, but uh, just just a, a rural North Carolina, um, uh, sort of small town guy. Well, and someone who's highly qualified to sit on the state Supreme Court. So thank you for the sacrifice you're making to run for office and to run for the state Supreme Court, because I think you'll make a great justice. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so tell me, what made you decide to run for the state Supreme Court, Phil? Well, Tammy, Tammy people don't like judges to be political, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we want judges to decide cases on, on the law and the facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we are in North Carolina is, is we've got an imbalance on our Supreme Court. There, there's, there's seven members of the court and there's only one conservative protecting your constitutional rights on the North Carolina Supreme Court. And that's Paul Newby. And, and I see Paul as, as sort of a lonesome guy up there on the he needs uh, company he doesn't does. he <laughs> so so we've we've got this hashtag uh, we we've used this hashtag newbie needs a wingman right because he <laughs> needs help uh and, and uh, an extra set of eyes up there on the supreme court but but really it comes down to um uh, opportunity to serve uh you know we've had the the pleasure and the ability to serve the state in a number of different ways and uh, uh when chief justice stepped down and and uh, justice newbie decided to run for that spot, uh, his, his spot was, was available and, and we thought it would be a, uh, uh, a good opportunity to serve. 
That's wonderful. Well, I, I know that you're totally dedicated to serving the public, and I thank you to step up and be the wingman for Justice Newby because I'm sure he is busy writing dissenting opinions these days. <laughs> right, yeah. So so I, I joke with him. The Court of Appeals, where I serve now, is right across from the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and, and I joke with him that it, it's it, I see smoke coming up from, <laughs> from the printers and, and the, the chimney over there. So. It must be very frustrating to be the only conservative, so I, I hope that you can help him when you get there. Well, um, I, I will say this. Justice Newby and I have uh, been friends uh, for, for a long time. I've known mm -hmm. him since about 2004. Uh, he swore me in as DA, swore me in as a judge on the Court of Appeals. Wow. Uh, and I think, I think what, uh, what your viewers and people who follow the legal community would discover is that, that we, we tend to think alike. That's wonderful. Well, I was just going to ask you that next is uh, tell me what your judicial philosophy is. Right. So, so I'm, I'm an originalist and a textualist. And, and really, that's just uh, uh, a way to say that I, I believe that uh, when the legislature passes a law or, or a constitutional amendment is in place, uh, that we interpret uh, those provisions as they're written. We do not uh, substitute our will. We do not legislate from the bench. And we interpret or apply the law as written. And uh, if, if we had more judges who did that, uh, I think there would be more predictability, more certainty, uh, and more stability in our law. Yes. Um, so, Phil, tell me which uh, U.S. Supreme Court justice you, uh, you identify with the most in terms of judicial philosophy. Well, can I, can I say Amy Coney Barrett yet? You can, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> you know, her, her devotion to family and uh, her, her work with, with her family and, and is just remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I, I look forward to, to seeing more of her and reading more uh, of her opinions uh, in the future. But, but in terms of individuals who are on the court now, I, I think Justice Alito is, is the one that I most identify with. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look at his... Uh, uh, constitutional interpretation uh, of not only uh, Fourth Amendment issues, but but also um, his, his um, uh, opinion on values, uh, the opinions he's written on values, I, I think line up with uh, sort of how, how I see the law. That's great. I certainly like him as well. Um, he would be my pick on the current court. So what's it like sitting on the Court of Appeals right now? Uh, right now, it, it's it's much like uh, uh, every meeting you go to, right? Everything we we do is on Zoom or, or, or our version of Zoom. Uh, so so there's there's a little bit of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, a quiet place now. It's not as uh, busy uh, as it once was. But um, you know, serving on the Court of Appeals is a real honor. Uh, in 2016, um, some 2.2 million people uh, cast their vote for me, and and that is. Uh, um, it's an honor to it go into work. It must be very humbling day. to it, know that. Yes, it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we we get to make weighty decisions, uh, mm -hmm. decisions that impact uh, economics, that impact your family, your schools, and uh, your community. So, so the the fact that the voters uh, selected me uh, to make those types of decisions uh, is, is, it is humbling. So, how do you think sitting on the Court of Appeals has prepared you to sit on the state Supreme Court? Well, so, so being a judge is not that different from being a prosecutor, right? That if, if you think for just a minute about what, what are the prescribed duties of a prosecutor, he's the only, he or she, uh, are the only ones in the courtroom uh, whose duty is uh, to do justice, right? The, the judge is to apply the law as written. Mm -hmm. And uh, defense attorneys and, and attorneys in civil or criminal cases have a responsibility to zealously represent their clients. The prosecutor's the only person who is charged with uh, actually doing justice, to make uh, the correct decision or the right decision based on the law, the facts, and what justice is. Uh, so, so that experience as a prosecutor, uh, I think, prepared me to, to be a judge. Uh, and, and certainly the, the last three and a half, four years on, on the court, hearing some of the, the difficult cases that, that come across our desk from all across the state uh, have, have prepared me to, to be a justice on the Supreme Court and to be Justice Newby's wingman. That's great. Well, I think it's very important uh, that you win this seat so that we can start to chip away at that uh, activist liberal majority on the court. So 
I, I want to thank you for running and I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, Tammy, thank you. And certainly thank you to the viewers. Um, you know, the election's coming up soon. Uh, it's an important election. We hear that all the time, but uh, I would appreciate uh, you taking a look at my record, taking a look at my background. Uh, and uh, my website is philbergerjr.org, philbergerjr.org. And Tammy, thank you so much. You're welcome. And I think you can see in our audience why we've endorsed uh, Phil Berger for this seat on the state Supreme Court. And um, so I just want to thank you for joining us tonight. And if you've enjoyed tonight's version of The Voice, then I encourage you to go to our website, ncvalues.org, where you can watch past episodes of The Voice. Thank you and good night. Which of these issues do you care about? What if you could influence how they were legislated? What if you could impact the outcome of the next election? What if you could change the course of America?